how you show up in a room is a little hint for people about the kind of person that you are. And so the closer your insides and outsides match, the more aligned you are in all of those things, the easier your life is going to roll. It's a bit like having your car's wheels aligned, right? If your car's wheels are going off in separate directions or your feet are going in separate directions, pretty soon, oh, it's not going to make any, you're not going to get anywhere. But when things are lined up and you're really clear and you like the way you look and the way you look is getting good results, then you're good. You are now listening to the podcast where authors inspire listeners to become authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer, best-selling author, and book enthusiast, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be listening to a different author that will inspire you to join the business of immortality, known as authorship. Now let the fun begin. Today's episode is sponsored by both books, Going North, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself, and the follow-up bestseller, Stay the Course, The Elite Performer's Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success. Head over to Amazon.com, pick up both books. They are available in a trifecta of paperback, audio, and ebook. Cop all three of both and be on the lookout for another book from yours truly to help podcasters succeed. Now let's get on with today's episode. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors known as the Going North Podcast, we got another super special awesome human for you today courtesy of podmatch.com. The wonderful site where podcast guests get to connect with podcast hosts. And if they're cool, they're freaking in. And if they're not cool, then they just get freaking ignored. And this is a guest you definitely want to ig- not ignore because she is a super special awesome human, folks, because she is a prolific author of multiple books as well as a keynote speaker, a certified coach through the ICF, as well as a professional presence expert. So my goodness, my goodness, you're going to be in for a treat that's good enough to eat five times over indeed, because you're going to find your healthy image today. Thanks to this wonderful human right here, the kind and lovely yourself, the one and only Catherine Lazarus. How are you doing today, Catherine? I'm doing very well. Thank you for all your kind words. That was quite an introduction. No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. They're going to make a book called Top 10 Biggest Lies. No pressure is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm trying to think of what, what, yeah, anyway. I'm still trying to think of what would one of the other top 10 biggest lies be? Hmm. <laughs> it's fine. That, that would be it. It's fine. How is it? It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's probably even higher than uh, no pressure. Yeah. 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 If, you're, if, if your spouse say, hey, it's fine. Nothing's wrong. It's like, all right. Well, I'm about to go on a five week vacation. When you find yourself, I'll be back. <laughs> if it's still fine, if it's still fine, I'll go for two days. Let me stop. <laughs> yes. It's like I gotta play mind reader, psychologist, salesman, underwater basket weaver, and scuba diver. Yeah. I yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't play those games. My husband and I, we don't play those games. I we do not mind read. Like you can intuit how somebody's doing, but it's always better to ask. Just always better to ask and communicate. Use your words, people. Just use your words. Heck yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Use your words indeed. That's right, indeed. Well, speaking of words, I probably only got a limit when it comes to introductions, and I probably only covered, I don't know, what, 100 maybe? 75 out of, I don't know, 7.5 million of them. So my goodness, my filling in any cavities I may have missed about you on how you became the Catherine that you are today since your first time on the show. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to give you a nutshell of how I got here. A million years ago, I finished my degrees at school, right, when I was a kid, and I studied the opera and I studied education. So my first outing in the work world was singing in the opera. So I did that in San Francisco and Vienna and a few other places in the world and teaching elementary school music. And it took me about 12 years and a lung tumor to figure out that those jobs were not for me. (laughs) And yeah. And when I was diagnosed, my husband said, you have to leave these jobs. They're killing you, literally. And that's the thing about those two careers, even though they sound pretty great, you know, that's not a bad job. They're both really quite narrow. They're like small box parameters they got narrow parameters right and so I'm not a very good small box person 
but I didn't know that kind of until that moment. Like I'd always felt kind of squashed and I didn't know that. But anyway, when I got, when I got diagnosed, I thought, okay, this is it. I had no plan. I mean, I had tenure. I would have had to kill somebody to get fired. Like I had a good <laughs> job, pension, the whole thing. And I'm like, nope, gotta go. And so I focused on my health. And I started working with a coach and six months later, the tumor was gone. And I had a job doing corporate training at PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is a, a big accounting firm, sort of global organization. And in the, in the middle, when I was working with the coach, I was sort of having that existential crisis that we have from time to time. And he basically was kind of an alpha male dude. And he was sitting at his desk and he's like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up, little lady? Yeah. And yeah, I know. And it, like, I mean, today I'd be like, don't talk to me like that, man. You're fired. <laughs> right. But at the time, <laughs> I laughed. And I literally had this bizarre vision. Like, for anyone who's listening, like a visual thinker, I don't know if you're a visual thinker, Dom, but it, it was super weird because I've never had anything like this since. And I had never had anything like this before that. But I literally had a vision of the first company name I ever used and the first tagline I ever used, which happened to be ICU image consulting. And it was, intensive care for your image was the first tech one. It just came a big download. And I started to laugh and I was like, that's not even a real job. Like who does that job? And my coach to his credit said, no, it's a real job. You could do that job. And because there's no regulation in the industry at all, like you could hang your shingle out tomorrow and say, I'm an image consultant and nobody would blink. It's completely unregulated. I thought, well, I don't know. I look all right. You know, I've read some books. I'll just get a website and some business cards and start practicing. <laughs> so that's what I did which I don't recommend to anybody now. I'm like, please get some training because <laughs> right, please get some training. And the reason being that when you start talking about image issues with people, that's very intimate. It's very tender territory. And you really need to know what you're talking about in turn, not just in terms of the physical clothing piece, but you need to understand the psychology and you need to be careful with people self image, right. Encased in that sort of world. So then, you know, I built my business up around my corporate job, like many people do. And when the recession hit in sort of 2008, 2009, the corporate contract ended and I was like, okay, I think this is a great time to start my own image consulting business, yeah. <laughs> continue it for real in the recession. And my husband told me a couple of years ago, actually, he said, you know, when you said you were going to do that, I thought you were crazy, but I didn't mm. say anything. And I'm like, good husband, right? And and so, of course, this many years later now, it's still okay. So I went to Toronto and I got my certifications in image consulting and advanced image consulting there. And I interned at the company and the woman who runs the company liked me. So then she made me her Western Canada image trainer. So in addition to my private practice, for many years, I was also teaching consultants how to be consultants. I taught the business of image at Langara, which is a, a college here in Vancouver. And so, if, you know, fast forward a few years and my clients are moving up the chain in their corporate, their corporate lives. And they said, we really want you to come and work with our executive teams, but we can't, we're tired of explaining to the people that write the checks that you're not really an image consultant. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're like, you're what? obviously more than that. Like you're doing coaching and you're like very well-rounded and you're good with business. So like, you're obviously more than that. So we need you to change your, change your name. And I'm like, okay. So I changed to Lazarus Consulting and now I can do what I like, which is always my preferred state of affairs. And so since then I've been doing different kinds of corporate work in my, in my day job, in my business life. My role in the world is to help accelerate, rapidly accelerate women into senior leadership and within senior leadership, because I really am tired of waiting for gender parity. And I think we need more balance in the world. And there are some really lovely men that also have a really balanced approach, which is great, but we really need a different kind of leadership model. So that's what I'm working to change. So I'm just tired of lip service around diversity. It's like, let's actually get on that, shall we? <laughs> we need some younger people, we need some diverse perspectives. And so that's my, that's my jam in my day job. And then when I'm not doing that, I started picking up my artistic life again. So I had wanted to write a business book and this was just sort of pre kind of pre COVID it was sort of 2020 somewhere in there, like right when it hit and I've been running wanting to write a business book and I don't know how you make your decisions or think about things but sometimes when I don't know how to do something what I like to do is just write in my my little notebook I'm like okay hey, universe I want to do this thing and then I just write a list of questions <laughs> like who do I need to talk to next 
what kind of information do I need to gather? Who would be a good helper for this? Or what else do I need to know? What am I missing? And then I just close the book and I walk away and I let it percolate because sometimes things work within us without us. Don't have to be obsessing about it all the time. And eventually an answer will come through. So I did this for this business book thing. Cause I have no clue. I've never written a book. I don't know how to do it. And about a week later, again, I got this sort of insight. It was like, oh, right. I think my friend Tina, who I knew through business networking, I think she's doing a story coaching thing. Like, I think that's what she's doing now. So I email her. I'm like, hey, are you doing a story coaching thing? You help writers do their thing. And she's like, yeah, I actually am I'm doing a retreat in, this was like October, I think 2020. And she goes, I'm doing a retreat in November, which is socially distanced and you know all that. Do you want to come? And I'm like, yeah, I want to come to your retreat. And so I get to the retreat and I tell her I want to write this business book. And she, her whole thing is about helping people write the stories from their soul. So really like what work is being called into the world. And so as we got talking about it, it became really clear that I had another book kind of knocking at the door. It, like, you know, right? Writing a book, sometimes you just have something on your mind that you need to write first before you can write the thing you set out to write. So the first book that I wrote is called Love is Not Pie, Variations on a Monogamish Theme. Lovely book. And it was based on, uh, my husband and I are polyamorous. And so this book details the journey from our sort of monogamous, our monogamous, um, functionally monogamous relationship into a polyamorous relationship. And it was sort of like over four years, I had this relationship with a man outside our, my marriage. And I wrote him a lot of poetry. I was inspired. And so when I printed out all the poetry, it was like a big stack. I'm like, okay, that's like three or 4,000 words of poetry, which is a lot of poetry. And so I show Tina this thing and she's like, okay, great. Well, we need the backstory. So I'm like, okay, I'll go write the backstory. Da, 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 da. Write the backstory. She's like, okay, la, 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 you're in love. We get it. Ha, ha. Uh, now we need the, now we need the teeth. She's like, she's very yes. And kind of coach, which I appreciate. Now we need the teeth. And I'm like, oh, I can write the teeth. I write the teeth. And then she sh helped me shape it. And then we took it to Friesen Press, which is a, a, a company here in, in Canada, and published it and have not looked back, um, recorded the audiobook for it. So all of that's on Amazon if people want to look for it. And it's been really fun. And then I went to write my business book again. And then I still couldn't write my business book because <laughs> this other book came out. So after I kind of cleared out the whole attachment wounding, love is not pie, you know, all the, all the romance craziness with that, then it became really clear that in order for me to really reclaim like my singing voice and really go forward with this artist self piece of me that I'd kind of sublimated a little bit, I was like, okay, I've got some unpacking, like family of origin, father relationship stuff to unpack. And so my second book, Songs for My Father, uh, huh? Uh, came out I I it just sort of fell out of me and I wrote that and to do the book launch for this one instead of just throwing a party I actually took significant songs from my artistic life so all the way like musical theater from when I was like 10 or 12 and winning trophies all the way up to the vintage jazz I'm getting doing now so there was some musical theater there was some cabaret there was some burlesque stuff there was some art song some opera and now this vintage jazz so it was this smattering of different tunes and I hired four of really killer musicians here in Vancouver. And I said, hey, guys, this is my idea. Here's the text. We're going to take some excerpts from the book. And here's the songs. And we're going to use excerpts from the songs. And we're just going to play we play and hang out and rehearse something until something shows up. Are you in? And they're like, <laughs> yeah, we're in. <laughs> so, so we did this show, this like one woman show of, of the songs from my father as the launch uh, at Tyrant Studios in Vancouver. So if anyone ever comes through Vancouver and you want a great jazz bar, Tyrant Studios is awesome and it's above a strip club so you have to be like you go into the strip club and then you go up and around the corner and that little studio is actually all the greats have played there it's just the perfect hole in the wall jazz club it's tiny anyway really lovely so we did that and then <laughs> now now I have a third there's a plan seven in this particular series it's sort of like my change work as I'm getting older like why why I wrote them was more like they're like a purgative. Uh, they're very cathartic for me to write them. It's a way for me to, it's like, I have this experience and I've processed all the feelings and now it's contained in the book. So then I'm finished with it, which is, a, I don't know, it's just the way I write books. It's some of the reasons why I write my art books. 
because it's art, right? I'm expressing myself and it's it's out there. So now I have the third book of the art series is underway now. And I'm finally writing my business book, right? Like, you know, trying to trying to get on that. And then the fourth book in the series, fourth book in the art series is after that. So I've got, and then the, the other three, I kind of know what they are, but they're not fully formed. So you're an you're a multiple book author, so you understand, right? It's like you always got like three or four things that you're thinking about and three or four things on the go at any given time. And, you know, you try not to talk too much about it until it's fully formed and it's kind of coming out. But I had a great experience writing my books. It was really, really fun. And, and my Freeze and Press was great um, in their guidance with that. And getting a writing coach was great because it's difficult. It's di if you're not an editor and you're not like you have something to say, but you don't know how to say it having someone really help you with it is a, a great strategy because otherwise you send your stuff in, you know, and, and you get slammed. <laughs> it hurts, right? You know, if you send stuff in, that's not really ready for publishing. That's, that's tough. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how I got here. I got here. Lots of therapy, <laughs> lots of self discovery, <laughs> lots of commitment to it's like, what was I meant to do here on the planet? Well, I'm going to go do that then. And I'm going to do all the digging that I need to do personally to do it. And I'm going to find all the people I need to help me do it. And I'm going to do it because maybe this is my last time around. I don't know, but I'm going to have a good time. Leave something behind. Uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. Leaving something behind indeed. That's right indeed. That's right indeed. So writing all the magical books to eventually get to the business book. Is, do you even have a working title for the business book yet? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I'm I'm just, it's still really new. So it's something that I'm, I, I try not to talk about things before they're really, because everybody says that, right? Oh, I'm working on a book. It's like, okay. <laughs> right. But it's, it's yeah, not yet, but thank you for asking. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. Indeed. So my goodness, my goodness, I love and pie. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. I usually joke, pre-record and be like yeah so we're going to talk about penguins and pie today and i forgot <laughs> to mention it and it's like oh no i remember why i forgot to mention it because that's in your title, <laughs> my title. well it's funny it's funny because like people are like well why that and i'm like well because love is not pie like if i give you some love I still have lots of love to give other people but time is pie so if i give you a slice of time i can't give somebody else that slice of time like until we get into the quantum physics realm can't do that so it's there's a little bit of a joke in the polyamorous community about we some people sometimes say you shouldn't say you're coming out as polyamorous you should say you pencil in <laughs> because the, <laughs> the scheduling is a little can get a little bit uh challenging if you have multiple partners which i don't but people do right so it's very interesting it's a very it's very interesting stepping into this phase of my life and claiming and naming everything that exists for me, like not hiding anything, just standing right up and saying, hey, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. <laughs> this might be a function of being over 50. I don't know. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That just means it's another chapter in the magical book of life. That's right. Indeed. That's right. Indeed. So why the polyamory? Was it like boredom? And it's like, let me get out of here. Let's try some. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, I actually, it actually is interesting. This is what I really like about the younger generations right now. The younger, oh, I sound like I'm 80. What I really love is the, the, what they're bringing to light are words for all the things that I had no words for growing up. So when I was young and I started to date, I liked lots of different people and I could never really understand the drama around I'm dating one person, but I really like this other person too. And why can't I spend time with them the same as I like no relationship is the same, right? Every relationship you have, you're learning, you're growing, you're a different, you're expressing a different facet of who you are. It's different, right? You're a different version of yourself in everybody else's eyes. So it's more, it's more like a, an experiential piece. But when I was younger, I just didn't really understand. And so I'd have to be as more of a serial monogamist, right? It's like, well, I'm going to break up with you and date this person. And then I'm going to break up with you and date this person. And, but I always felt this strangeness about that. And so of course I did want to be married because also our society is pretty full of compulsory, you know, mononormativity and heteronormativity. 
Um, I didn't want to be married. They call it the relationship escalator, right? There's there's a great book by Amy Garan. She's a journalist in Colorado who interviewed 1,500 people who have very unusual, just have different relationship styles. And she wrote this book called Off the Relationship Escalator. And it really outlines the way Western society sort of puts you on this, this escalator where you're like, you're dating and then you get more serious and you get exclusive boyfriend, girlfriend, and then you move in and then you get married and maybe you have kids. Like the pinnacle of the escalator is you're married with kids and you die, right? But you could at any time choose to step off the escalator, right? Because like your friendships stay at the same level. I mean, they might deepen, become more intimate over time, but you know, there's no, there's no need to escalate except it happens kind of automatically because that is what is expected of you. And I wanted to be married specifically because I wanted to know who I was in that container. And I wanted to see how I would grow in that kind of relationship with that level of commitment, with that level of honesty, with that level of depth. I wanted to do that. And so um, when I met my husband, it's interesting because there was this other person, this other man who was also interested, but he didn't really tell, he didn't say really clearly that he was, you know, wanted a shot. And so that's, he's actually the other, the person in Love is Not Pie, because I always said, I'm like, man, if I had another chance to hit that, I'm going to, I'm going to take it. And then it came around again. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and my husband and I had always had discussions about, like, before we got married, we had all the talks, which is good to have before you get married about, you know, how do you handle money? How do you handle family? What do you think about sex? What are your deal breakers? And my my husband and I took lots of long walks and we had very in-depth conversations about that. And when it came to deal breakers, I was like, okay, well, abuse for sure. That's a deal breaker. I'm out. Addiction. If there's no improvement, like if someone's in recovery and they're trying to do something that's different, I'll stay around all day for personal growth. But if you're going to go down the addiction hole, I'm not going with you. You are out. So there's that. And, you know, the other deal breakers. And I was like, when it came to adultery, I was like, eh. But like, don't lie to me, right? Lying, don't lie to me. Deal breaker. There's no upside to lying to me. Just don't lie to me. So by the, and we always talked about like celebrity hall passes, you know, like, hey, you know, <laughs> I said to my husband, I'm like, look, if you are in a room with Scarlett Johansson and she says she wants to go to bed with you, you should go. <laughs> <laughs> like, because you can just tell me about it later. Like, you should go do that. <laughs> so we always joked about that kind of thing. So then when this opportunity came up and I said, hey, you know, it actually was a, we were playing a game on New Year's Eve called Big Talk, uh, which is like a series of questions on cards that you can use as conversational jumping off points. And I said to him, what have you always, he said, what have you always wanted to ask me, but never have? And I said, well, if you could, have other relationships would you because he also never had any other relationships before me and i didn't think it oh, would wow. be fair yeah i didn't think it'd be fair if he had an opportunity for me to say no just because we were married because i really firmly believe that relationships are how we grow and so if you have the opportunity to take to have relationships that's a good thing to do so and then this opportunity came and i said you know how do you feel about that and he's like okay and we're like we're great communicators you know we can handle it no also do not recommend <laughs> Like zero out of 10. If someone is considering, if they, if you think you're poly and you're thinking about changing the dynamic of your already negotiated relationship, I deeply recommend getting a counselor who understands poly. Definitely do some reading, like go read Poly Secure, go read uh, More Than Two, go read Ethical Slut, go read those things. Get some education, like go make some friends in the poly community. And prepare yourself for the, the emotional, mental management that you're going to, you're going to need a lot of depth and control to be able to handle the increased emotional load, right? Because it's, it's complex. So he and I actually kind of crashed and burned, like in just like four or six months in was the summer of hell. And I went to see a counselor that I knew because I was like, oh my gosh, like what's going on here? This is terrible. I had this great marriage and now we're this is not going well. What's happening? And I went to see her and I, I talked with her and I said, you know, I said, I think I'm polyamorous. And she's like, duh. She's known me for a really long time. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I think I'm bisexual. And she's like, duh. And the funny thing is, is, anytime I said anything to my friends about what was happening, they're like, yeah. 
<laughs> they're all hmm. right you know how your friends sometimes can see things you can't so in any case uh i went home and i'm ugly crying on the couch so like i went under the couch and i'm telling him everything and i'm ugly crying and he's on the other end of the couch and he's listening like he always does he's an incredibly patient incredibly smart really multifaceted deep dude and he looks over at me and he goes oh i thought maybe you misunderstood me because i had said to him look if i'm poly and you're you're if i'm polyamorous and you're monogamous that's a problem that is a fundamental renegotiation of a marriage agreement and maybe that's not going to be okay like maybe we maybe we'll need to split because that's a big deal so anyway he goes me i thought you misunderstood me and i was like oh and he goes i'm i feel that way too i feel poly like i think that's me and i'm like okay thank god and so from that, that was like rock bottom. And then it was like a rebound. It's like, okay, now we're on the same page. Now we're going to figure it out. Now we're going to work on our communication skills. And not only that, but this whole, that whole experience going through all of that deepened our marriage immensely. And the reason is because then you're forced to discuss things like, what does loyalty mean to you? What does fidelity mean to you? what's jealousy look like what is really intimacy what is privacy to you what kind of communication patterns do you want to have how do you want to handle upset how do you repair after rupture whereas sometimes people walk into marriage and they have no conversation about any of those things so it's difficult but this particular this particular orientation like the way we are has forced us to really very deeply consciously examine what we're doing in our relationship and it's been great so great you know bar that first rocky bit it was great and then when the outside relationship ended we actually decided to close our relationship for a little while and, and get some counseling and and get and then we did all the things that i recommended people do before they even think about it right then we got our counseling and then we did our reading and then we made friends and then we started to date uh, other couples and now we date separately and right now we're not dating anybody so so it, it's like any other kind of relationship flow it's pretty pretty normal so it wasn't at all boredom because my uh, sometimes i joke about my husband i'm like 20 years later i'm still not bored he's definitely not boring but it was more like this is how we are and we luckily now live in a in a place where that's actually safe to be open about that. Cause there are certainly places in the world. Um, I actually went on a date with a guy from Turkey and he's like, Oh no, you'd be like, no, you cannot You'd be stoned in the street. I mean, of course he's exaggerating. I hope he's exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. There are places in the world that it's not safe to be someone like me. Right. Not safe to be a woman. First of all, not safe to be part of the LGBTQ world and certainly not safe to be polyamorous openly. Right. But I think, you know, we do not, we sometimes in our political worlds try to pigeonhole people when people cannot be pigeonholed. People are, are va there's a vast spectrum of the ways that people exist in the world. And I think it's a mistake to try to box everybody in. But I do really appreciate the younger generations for bringing forward words to describe things that I felt. And I think that's great. So no, it wasn't boredom to answer your question. Did that answer your question though? Ah, uh, yes indeed, yes indeed. A definitely <laughs> good deal, especially a little insight into that, because that's now really a lot more popularized, especially in Western culture, where it's like, oh yeah, when you realize, oh, these folks have been together for years and years, they had these outside relationships. It's just that you didn't find out till one of them was dead. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's not like people weren't doing it. It's like being gay. It's like not like not like gay people don't exist. Right? They've always existed. Just like we're only hearing about it now because people are actually able to say the truth about the way people are. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And I'm I feel I I recognize too that it's I have the privilege of being able to be open about it because lots of people don't. Right. Uh, that's what i'm talking about indeed so do you did you feel more fulfillment in i guess in that phase with the open relationship when y'all were dating separately as opposed to when you decided to not date separately did you feel like a higher sense of 
liberation and fulfillment like during those times compared to times where it's like oh no nah, monogamy where it's said i picked this one <laughs> i like this one better i'm keeping this one <laughs> it's definitely not a comparative kind of thing and i i wouldn't say that i feel any more or less fulfilled when we're dating or not dating it's like it's like if i'm sorry are you single or married or partnered or not partnered or Oh, no, I'm 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 on the single side of the game, not the not rushing side. for marriage. <laughs> no, right. So so that would so like you as a single person or anybody listening who's a single person, do you feel like when you're partnered, do you feel more fulfilled when you're partnered, or do you feel fine when you're single, or is it sort of just it's just two different states of being? Because that's how I feel about it. I'm like this is you know I'm dating and it's something I'm doing and I'm not dating because right now I don't have time to to offer somebody time right to develop a relationship so i don't feel any more or less fulfilled it's just different and it's kind of nice because you get to experience the new relationship energy when you when you have somebody new in your life at the same time that you get to develop you get to experience long-term relationship energy and so you get this beautiful warm loving deep kind of interesting dynamic and then you get this sort of fiery sparky kind of my husband calls it new car smell <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> really. Yes. Right. We ah. joke about it. We come into car smell. Um, <laughs> you know, it's 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 nice, but it's it's still. I think part of the problem with the depiction in media is that people still see it as sexual, or they only see it as temporary, or they don't see it as real somehow in relationships wise. But everybody's people, and so there's all still all the feelings are involved. It's all still relational. Right. We all still need to, to be respectful uh, and care for all the people that we're, we're around. So the answer to that question is no, I don't feel any diff. I don't feel any more or less fulfilled. I just have it in a di It's just a different state of being. I'm pretty fulfilled all the time. I'm kind of lucky. I've pursued, pursued life pretty fiercely, pretty hard and been determined. So I, I feel pretty, pretty fulfilled all the time, which is nice. Yeah. Uh. I guess cream filled like pie, huh? Let me stop. <laughs> you did not go there. <laughs> it's like censored. Oh my goodness. Um... <laughs> That's right, indeed. Hey, we say love is not pie. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny because we recorded some TikTok videos for the, and we still have to put them up, but we recorded some TikTok videos, and one of them has a piece of love, like apple pie. There's a fantastic pie shop in Vancouver called um, Aphrodite Pie, and they make the best pie. So good. So we went there oh. and did a little filming of their pie. Anyway, it was good. Well, I guess it was an oh. excellent time. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Those were salad days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Yes, it did. So my goodness, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're on these podcasts? Hmm. I get asked lots of really great questions. Hosts are always really good at asking things that are interesting. Um, what do I wish I got asked more often? Hmm. Is there something you wish you asked people more often? Yeah, you're actually the first person to actually flip that one on me. Uh, <laughs> not really, but I got this one for you since you're an entrepreneur. So with entrepreneurship, there's going to be some setbacks along the way. So has there been a major setback that actually ended up setting you up for success all the time that happens all the time i think it happens in life too when i started the business of course it was a recession so that was you know economic conditions were what they were and i had a total dark night of the soul like i didn't have any savings when i started it i just had a line of credit that was clear and i had clear credit cards so i was financing everything myself just through through debt basically taking on debt to grow and i made an investment in a coach because I didn't know anything about business really. And so I invested in a business coach and that year my business doubled partly because of the coach, but also because he <laughs> he's very blunt. And when I first started my business, I was really into self-expression. So be your true self, wear what you want, love what you wear, you know? So my own look was a little bit eclectic. And so I came in to work with him in his fancy boardroom and I sit down with my five subject Hillary spiral notebook to take notes, my glitter pen. And he walked into the room and he looked at my little book on the table and he left, said nothing, walked out of the room. Then he comes back in with one of those Hillary, uh, sorry, one of the, like, you know, the Moleskine books with the bookmark, the hardcover, like notebook. 
And he puts it down on the table and he said, I want you to transfer all of your notes from that into this. And I never want to see that on my table again. And I was like, damn, right, exactly. And I was like, what do you mean? My clients love how practical I am down to earth. These are great books. And he's like, what kind of consultant are you again? And I went, Mm. yeah, an image consultant. And he goes, exactly. We don't live in a vacuum. So there are expectations, no matter where we go, there are expectations of what you might be. And you can choose to buck those expectations, but then you're going to be spending a lot of time explaining to people why you are the way you are. So you can be your unique self. I'm all for that. And we don't live in a vacuum. So it's something that needs to be considered. So it was partly me adjusting my appearance. So it was still me, but more elevated, more polished, a little bit more elegant. Also because I was starting to do more corporate work and I needed to honor the environment that I'm in. So I would wear a suit, but it might be a bright blue suit. Um, You know, I would wear glasses, but they would be funky glasses, as you see. Those kinds of things. So it's really important to consider if you're thinking about making a change in your own life think about who you are as a person and then the other things that layer out from that and your and your industry is one of them and your company is one of them and your culture is one of them and your geographical area is one of them vancouver is very casual not very hard to look good in vancouver because most people run around in fleece so if you make the slightest effort you generally stand out whereas if you're in someplace like new york it might be a little harder to stand out right? Because geographically, the, the fashion quot- quotient is higher. So anyway, so I had, I, I basically had this dark night of the soul kind of prior to that. And I was just literally like snotting down my face going, Oh, my God, I'm gonna lose the house and what's going on. And I was like, Okay, okay, universe, God, you did this to me. <laughs> I'm doing what you told me to do. You better send me a sign. And the next morning, I actually didn't really sleep that night. My poor husband was sitting. He's like, what, do you, what can I do? I'm like, just go to sleep. One of us should be sleeping. <laughs> I'm like sitting there and I'm like, okay, God, you better send me a sign to show me I'm on the right track. Like now, or I, I, I'm like, this has to work, right? I don't have a plan B, this has to work. And so I get up, I had to, a business meeting at 6am the next morning with a whole group of people in a networking meeting. And I got up, I put my game face on, I go to the meeting and sure enough. And after the meeting, I had to do a photo shoot, so I'm like sitting, getting my makeup done in this chair. And my friend who was the makeup artist, she gave me that look and she's like, how are you? And I'm like, "Ah, I'm fine. Ah." (laughs) And she said, you're not fine. We're talking about it right now. So I confessed. I said, this is what's happening. Business is not going that well. And I'm in debt and all the things. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, honey. She goes, the first time I went out on my own, I lasted six months. And then I got a job at the bank. You just do whatever it takes to keep going. And she said, and you'll feel like a big failure, but don't. You just do whatever it takes to keep going. And she said, the next time I went out, I didn't look back. And then gradually, I started hearing all these stories from all my entrepreneurial friends about like one guy who started his business, but worked evenings and weekends at Earl's for three years, like at a restaurant, waited tables for three years to make the business go. And then I heard these other stories, like all this challenge behind the scenes of things that look great. And this cycle doesn't stop happening. Like you can put things in place in your business, but you can't predict everything. And if you don't pay attention, your business will go away. So for example, during the pandemic, I spent so much time focusing on my art. I didn't pay as much attention to my business. And I wasn't as inspired because I was, because I'd been doing more corporate work, I started getting pulled into like pure business stuff. So my clients would say, Hey, can you come facilitate like this work back planning session? And I'd be like, well, I can. And I would do it because I love them, but I'm like, I don't really care. I don't care about that. Like anybody could facilitate that. If you want to have a really difficult conversation, that's my jam. If you want to be a whole person at work and you want to show up and look and look as good as you are and be amazing, that's my jam. But somebody else can do the other planning. So I wasn't very inspired. And sure enough, you know, I made some bold spending choices based on the fact that I thought some of my corporate contracts would renew and then they didn't. So then I was Mm -hmm. operating at a loss this many years in this established, I had my best year ever revenue wise, I did not pay attention to my money. And it went away. And it was like, okay, well, now I'm operating at a loss. Now what am I going to do? So, you know, pick back up my financial tools and pick up my cash flow statements and pick up, you know, the pieces that I need to pay attention to, and start paying attention and start working again and being like, okay, what do I want? And so then I refocused everything and started again. But I have this, it's a little bit like, 
it's a little bit like when like you're swinging on a trapeze and you reach out for the next thing and you're like ah. <laughs> but i can i can feel it i can feel the momentum building and i know that it will get better and it always does that's the other thing is you know it always gets better so i have a lot of faith and i ran on fear for a long time as a motivator but fear is a long-term motivator is really hard on your body it's hard on your mind it's hard on your heart so I changed a few years, I don't know, a few years ago, I was like, I'm going to go faith, not fear. And my mantra the whole year was faith, not fear, faith, not fear, faith, not fear. Because I kept thinking about the worst thing that could happen. But then I'm like, well, what's the worst thing that's ever happened? And I'm like, well, it was never that bad. So the evidence suggests that that's not going to happen. If you continue to work and you continue to show up and you continue to plant seeds and you're on the right track. And if something is really not working, like just like you're digging and you're digging and you're digging and you're digging. It's not working. It's not working. Not working. Try something different. Right. Like, like it's, it's just, it's just got to pay attention to the whispers and say, this is the right track. And you, you know, when you're on the right track, things flow smoothly, serendipity happens. You meet the right people. You know, you put a feeler out and something great comes back. Not every, not every seed you plant is going to grow, but some of them start growing. Like you could feel it. And if you're constantly getting blocked and you're having to force everything all the time, to me, that's a huge sign that it's not the right time or it's not the right thing and you need to regroup. doesn't mean you don't stick with the hard things, but if something constantly feels forced, it's like, just back off, back off. Maybe you need to run away for an afternoon, go to the beach, come back at it later, right? Sometimes you need to run away. Just briefly. Don't run away forever. That's not work. That doesn't usually work. Come back. But yeah, it's it's definitely I've had lots of setbacks where they've set me up. I have a feeling that this one's going to be good. This last little punch is sort of okay. Okay, this is a good learning opportunity for me. This is sh this is highlighting something where I really need to take care and pay attention. And so that's what I'm doing now, and it's starting to turn around, which just feels really good. As we'll I'm talking about <laughs> what's going to happen, I don't know, but I'm going to show up. I'll be there when it does. Heck yeah, indeed. Heck yeah, indeed. So many great things and gems to highlight. One of them that popped up into my head that still I freaking love is to honor the environment that you're in. It's like, yeah, be you, but at least dress like you care about yourself. It's like, hey, don't go too far off the deep end. <laughs> right. Yeah. Unless your goal is to be a total challenger which you can do, but then you can't be upset when people challenge you, right? So you have to, you have to accept, cause I'm a challenger for sure, but I aim for like about like, not like over the line, <laughs> like, like I aim for like, I'm going to be like 10% over the line so that I'm far enough over that it sort of wakes people up and makes them think, but not so far that people aren't listening. Right. But then when people push back, it's like, well, I can't be upset about that because I just challenged them on something. Anyway, thank you. I'm glad that was a nugget for you. I like it. Honor yourself, honor the environment you're in. You can dig, because folks use it more often, dig, because the pandemic, it's like, oh, folks are home for a few a couple yeah. of years, depending on what the situation was. And then folks go out and about. It's like, oh, I just want to wear sweatpants all day or pajamas <laughs> all day. I don't want to wear a suit and tie. Like, forget that crap. It's like, I got to put jeans. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's comfort, but it's like, ah. Uh, and so many crocs out there too it's like the comfortable shoes but come on <laughs> you know i think i think the pandemic was good for two things i think it was really i mean as terrible as it was it was terrible there's no question it was not it was terrible but i think it was good for clarification and i think that it was really good for humanization and my hope is that what we take away from it is connection and humanization from from that and we keep those parts and that we also get to keep the comfort in the sense that, okay, we're going to have work now that is better suited to the people that are doing it. And if you're going to wear a suit, you could make it a comfortable suit. Those exist. If you're uncomfortable in your clothes, that's, that's the clothes fault. Like don't buy those clothes, do something different. Buy clothes that fit you. Doesn't matter what size you are, buy clothes that fit you and you'll feel better and you'll look better. Heck yeah, indeed. And bring back essential worker traffic. I miss that so much. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the low traffic levels yeah, yeah exactly like bring that back like i don't know how we can do it bring it back like dude folks like it's a ghost town of scary i'm like man for 
get y'all freaking extroverts, man. I'm an <laughs> introvert on this road. Bring back the ghost town, baby. Like, yes, nobody cutting me off or nothing. This is beautiful. That's right, indeed. Yeah, that's right. My husband loves it. He was, yeah, he he was working like uh like two weeks in the office and two weeks at home, and so when he would drive to the office, he loved it because he's also quite introverted and he just loved the no traffic, no stress. He loved it. All the introverts did really well. People that uh, are ambiverts, like I'm, a little bit of both. It was harder, but uh, yeah. One of my introvert friends was like, "I'm in the best shape ever. I've been working out at home. I feel great. I'm like, Nobody's talking to me. It's perfect." <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> that's right indeed well since you're an image consultant and you're probably the one of the rare actually happen the show oh god i think i haven't had an image consultant or at least somebody with image consultant experience at least for god knows 750 episodes so yeah so yeah <laughs> that's a while well because i mean not, you know you might have an image consultant who's an author but what are they writing about right Oh yeah, good old life branding indeed. So when it comes to healthy image, a healthy self image, what are the top three things folks need to keep in mind? Uh, well, self image, Im those are sort of overlapping things. But for self image, like if you're thinking about who you are as a person, self image, I think it's very important to remember that you are. There's no one else like you in the world. And if you, I, I heard this anecdote one time where life is like a potluck dinner. And you bring your dish to the potluck and you season it the way you're seasoning it. And you cook it the way you're cooking it. And you've taken all the care and you bring it to the potluck. And if you don't come to the dinner, somebody else doesn't eat because they can only hear a message from you. They can only eat your dish and they starve if you don't show up to the potluck. So I think anytime you get into that hole of like worrying about or wondering whether or not you provide value, you're here. Therefore, you provide value. You exist. So that's the first piece is like really owning the fact that you have value, not attached to any of your accomplishments, not attached to anything material in this world, but you as a person have value. That's the first one. The second piece, I think, to remember with self-image, healthy self-image, or developing a healthy self-image is you're not the stories other people tell about you. Because when you're developing as a child, really your parents' function is to be a good mirror for you. So when you say, hey, I'm an artist, your parents are like, yeah, great, go do that thing. Or, you know, if you're out of line, they're like, hey, that's a little out of line. Like they're good reflectors for you to help you develop who you are. And if your reflectors maybe weren't the best reflectors, they had their own stuff going on, you have to do the work like you, you it, like once you're an adult it's too like it's your responsibility now like whatever happened to you as a kid it's your responsibility to do your own work to make your life fulfilled and so if your mirrors weren't that great you need to find new mirrors and you need to create your own and need to understand that the stories other people tell about you are not your identity that's not everything that who you, not everything that you are um so do some work around that and i think the last thing to remember is the coach that i'm working with now i'm really enjoying working with him and he said, he describes confidence. He's like to have confidence in a self-image. He goes, all it is, is knowing that you can help somebody. That's it. So if you're struggling with your self-image, one of the things you might want to think about is how do I help other people? Small things. It could be like, can I open the door for this person? Can I, I don't know, help them clean up their grocery cart or, uh, you know, small, like the smallest thing all the way to the biggest thing. I can help you change your life, Right there's something you can do in there to feel more confident is to help somebody else. I think is a really good way to do that, to help foster sort of bolster your self-image and go. I love the quote, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. So if the environment that you're in doesn't feel like a good fit, go find an environment that does fit. Go find the people that see you, go find the people that celebrate you, go find the people that value you. So those are three pieces for self-image. And then for image image, like your outside image, you need to take all that stuff you learn about who you are. That has to be the first part because who you are is going to affect how you feel about what you put on your body. So for example, I really like to be comfortable and I don't feel good when I'm not comfortable. So I don't wear things that are not comfortable. I wear things that are stylish. I wear things that fit. I wear things that are the right coloring for me and good for my body shape, but I feel good in everything that I wear. I feel unique and interesting in what I wear. So you really need to think about kind of who you are as a person. And then you need to think about your environment. It has to make sense. It has to be congruent. 
right? If you are a Reiki master and you are telling people you're dressed like a Reiki master and, and you're like in flowing, beautiful, colorful ribbons and scarves and all those things. And you tell someone that you're a bank CEO, that's going to create cognitive dissonance for the person that's meeting you. And it's going to be harder for you to gain credibility and to show the world who you are if you don't look like what you are. And as much as I hate the sort of don't, don't judge a book by its cover. And I believe that people do have inherent worth. People still do judge. We're still visual. People still have their, their filters and files. So it's very important that you consider the environment that you're in and try to find a middle way between those things. And then the last piece is you have a lot of control. You have a lot of control over how you are perceived and not from the place of, um, you can't control people's responses to you. But if you make all the details line up, people are likely to know you more quickly because it's a little bit like it's a bit like an appetizer right how you show up in a room is a little hint for people about the kind of person that you are and so the closer your insides and outsides match the more aligned you are in all of those things the easier your life is going to roll it's a bit like having your car's wheels aligned right if your car's wheels are going off in separate directions or your feet are going in separate directions pretty soon oh, it's not going to make any you're not going to get anywhere but when things are lined up and you're really clear and you like the way you look and the way you look is getting good results, then you're good. But you really have to think about those three things. So who you are as a person, how it makes sense in your environment, and then control the details as much as you can. Get a haircut, get clothes that fit you. If you go to Value Village to get them, if you go to Saks Fifth Avenue to get them, it doesn't matter, but you have a lot of agency and a lot of control over what you put on your body and how you show up in the world. You have control over your behavior. You have control over your thinking. You have control, even though it might not feel like it sometimes. And you might have to work really hard to create new neural pathways for good thoughts if you've been programmed with bad ones. But <laughs> you have a lot of control. So don't forget that. Don't forget that you you have power. Even if it feels like a tiny amount of power, you have power. So exercise it responsibly. Heck yeah. That's right indeed. Exercise your power responsibly. That's right, indeed. That's why I say drink responsibly. That's right, indeed. Right. That's Same. Right indeed. Same, because really, honestly, we need more people in power who are responsible with the exercise of power, because we have plenty of people who are in power that should not have power. <laughs> they are not responsible with it. That's right, indeed. The mm. gas electric company. Let me stop. <laughs> if there's a corn cob on your nightstand tomorrow, you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your face is priceless. Don't worry. That just means you had enough corny jokes, and it's like you're now seeing corny, corny jokes. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> uh, I guess your mind went west on that one, huh? <laughs> I know went straight south i don't know i actually really love corny <laughs> jokes i love a good pun like my husband and i will get into these punning competitions i love good puns i love ridiculous dad jokes i have a you know a very i can have a, a sophisticated sense of humor sometimes and then sometimes i just like straight up fart jokes like it's <laughs> inside i'm still uh, five you know what are you gonna do <laughs> <laughs> well if by technicality you still are five there's a five and 50 somewhere <laughs> I don't know. well that's true that's true i don't know i kind of think who you are at four is who you are at 104 so the inner <laughs> inner core of you doesn't really change and i think if we all remembered when we met each other that somewhere there's a kid inside you you know but we're all still people right i think that that gives you a, a softer more gracious approach to to people if you remember that in there somewhere there's a little kid you know just wants to be loved and seen and heard and valued no, it's true. It's true. Yep. Even Buddy Ma said everybody's a kindergartner. That's right. It's teach. true. It's so true. <laughs> yep. Just seeing folks regress and sometimes just show yeah, the true right? colors. It's totally. like, oh, you you weren't neutral gray this whole time. It was a whole rainbow. Yeah. Uh, I, know. I think that's one of the greatest privileges of my work, actually, is when somebody shows me something, I feel so lucky. Just like, wow, like, thank you for sharing that with me. And actually one of the best phrases that I've heard, this is actually good for any parents that are listening. When kids share things with you that are difficult, that they think are difficult, like this was in relation, I think, to a kid coming out as gay, but anything that kids share with you is, is a gift, I think. And their phrase was, so like, instead of using the phrase, 
I'll love you no matter what. I'll try to get your kids to tell you something. The phrase is, thank you for sharing that with me because everything you share with me just makes me love you more is a great phrase. And so I've used it to good effect on the, on the team. Like I don't have children myself, but I have a lovely um, 17. She'll be 17 tomorrow. Uh, my daughter's friend and uh, I've got other lovely, you know, our friends have kids and I really, my fabulous auntie uh, gets to come out and it's, it's, I've used that phrase to great effect with them and to with some adults too. It's like everything I learn about you just makes me love you more. Oh, so you're auntie meow. All right. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Sweet. So my goodness. So if your fabulous book, your fabulous book, Love is Not Pie, if that book were a food, what would it be and why? If it were a food. Oh, my God. It would be a banquet of sumptuous, delicious things. And the reason is because it has a lot of variety in it in terms of tonality. I use a lot of different words and I like to repeat some words. So you might be eating the same thing twice, but not in a different way. Yeah, it would be a banquet. It's very varied, I think. And it's delicious. It's like a completely rounded experience of description. And there's some sexy bits. So that's fun too. <laughs> Actually, my husband listened to the audiobook because he was transcribing some stuff. And he listened to the audiobook and he was like, damn, you could have warned me because our our arrangement is like he doesn't he doesn't like details. He doesn't want to know. He's like, Did you have a nice visit? <laughs> he doesn't like the details. I love the details. I want to know everything. Um <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so the audiobook is quite nice as a read as well. So yes, if it, if it were if it were food, it would be a banquet of different kinds of food. It's delicious. <laughs> well, I guess there's a cucumber on the nightstand. You wake up in the morning instead, then. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> and a corn cup. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> That's right, indeed. Keep it a corny. <laughs> mm. It's an all-you-can-eat banquet. <laughs> it ain't just go. a buffet. Yes. It's a banquet. <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. And then songs for my father's is different. It's it's a little bit spicier. It's a little bit more like, yeah. What would songs for my father be? Songs for my father. If it were a food, it would be a prickly pear. It's not easy to digest, and it could be painful but still worthwhile, I think. Ah, there we go. That's right, indeed. So have a cactus in your life, y'all. That's right. Let me stop. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. Well, that's kind of, I don't know, sometimes that's what life experiences are, right? It's Lisa, Lisa what's her name? Lisa Nichols. I quite liked her. She was, she's very, I find her quite inspirational. And she said, sometimes you get the gifts wrapped in sandpaper, right? And sometimes life experiences are like that where it's it's tough but then you get a beautiful gift out of it later but you don't always know it's a gift when it's coming yeah sometimes it hits you like a jack-in-the-box <laughs> that's for sure right Ugh. yeah and if you don't listen to the nudges from the universe eventually they'll hit you in the face with a two by four or run you over with a mac truck so it always pays, it pays to pay attention to the little nudges first heck yeah that's right indeed pay attention to all the <laughs> nudges indeed so my goodness, my goodness, speaking of nudges, we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. Okay, and all that right, is I'm ready. If... <laughs> She's ready like Freddie. I love to say it. Well, yeah, wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but you're still in the current Ooh. year. What advice would you give to yourself? Got it. So wait a second. So I'm 25, but not when I was 25. I'm 25 and it's 2023. Yep. You're basically a millennial. Oh God. Oh, uh, what would I, I wouldn't want? Oh my God. I would not want to be a 25 year old now. <laughs> I'm grateful that I was a 25 year old when I was a 25 year old. So, I, so hang on, let me just clarify. So it's, I'm 25, it's 2023, but I know everything I know now, but mm -hmm. I'm 25. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, then I would say, I would, I would get on my budgeting software. Well, but I already know what I know. Yeah. So I'm 25. Sorry. Was the question, what would I say if I was 25 or what would I do if I was 25 now? Like if I was now, well, yeah, do, just I still live in the, do I still live in my same place? Do I still know the same people? Or it's oh, just yeah, like, you poof, know, I wake up and I'm 25. Oh, it's poof. You wake up, you're 25. Wow. But it's, but everything else is the same, but I'm 25. 
So my husband is now married to a 25 year old. Yep. He is a cradle robber. Playful <laughs> <laughs> thought. Um, <laughs> so everything else is the same. And I'm 25. Man, I would be like, get it, girl. Be like 25, take those investments and do the work and buy stock. And oh man, I would take all my financial knowledge now, put that to good use. I'd buy more real estate. I, I mean, I would do those things anyway, but yeah, I, you know what? I don't think I would do much different. I would probably just go and do some work out harder, <laughs> like, like take better care of my body now that it's 25 again. I probably, I'd probably say, take really good care of your body. Even better, like I didn't take bad care of my body, but take better care of your body, get stronger, get faster. Yeah. That's what I would do. I would sort of, sort of aim for stronger, stronger, higher, faster. If I, if I woke up suddenly and I was 25, man, that would be a trip. Hey, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do if you woke up at 20? Well, maybe you are 25. I don't hold you are, but. Oh, yeah, me. What would you do? I'll be. I'd be going back six years if that was me. <laughs> yeah, <I> was freaking... <laughs> so you are a millennial. Oh, so like you're basically asking what advice would I give millennials now? Uh, master yourself is what I would say. Like if I'm talking to somebody in that age bracket, and actually I've met quite a few people who are sort of in that 22 to 30 age range. You've got it going on. Like, like you're accessing emotional intelligence stuff and social intelligence stuff that none of us had access to. So I I would be like, get master yourself as quickly as you can, soak in all the knowledge you can and improve your financial literacy now. Get YNAB, which is youneedabudget.com. Get on that and and really figure out those things because that's that's how the current world works. So you got to play the game and then then go change it if you don't like it. Which, yeah, there are many things not to like. Probably as many things as there are to like, but you have to look for the right things. Yeah, girl. That's right. Look for the right things, not the left things. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be political. <laughs> We're just talking about directions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right, indeed. It's like, yeah, yeah the, good, the good old USA is like, yeah, left wing, right wing. Look at us, the same damn bird. Shut up. Like, <laughs> That's crazy, right? And actually, oh, okay, I thought of one more thing. I thought of one more thing for 25-year-olds everywhere. Don't buy into this bullshit that 40, your life is finished. I am so tired of all of the top 30 under 30 and top 40 under 40. All that pressure, so much pressure. Life is long and the back half, as far as I can see, like it, I would consider myself to be a bit of a late bloomer because I didn't start my business until I was 30, like bef just before I was 40, it's like 38, 39 when I started and I didn't write my book until, so I was, let's say I'm 52 now. So I published my first book when I was like 40, 49, 50 and I'm working on more things. My business is going, I would like to see the top 100 under 100. That would be a list that I would be interested in seeing uh, on how they would measure it. But so if you're 25 and you think that you think that you have to have it all figured out, you don't, you absolutely do not need to. And your life does not end at 40. In fact, for women, it, it's pretty much just beginning at that point. So don't, don't buy into the hype. Do not buy into the hype that you have to have it all by 40. That is ridiculous. That is the dumbest thing ever. Don't do it. Don't buy into it. Don't do it. Sweet. That's right. Don't buy to it. Indeed. And funny enough, my running joke for folks in the certain number group, you're already 25 by default. The folks are dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's super weird. I asked my mom one time, like when she got, old, she's getting older. And uh, I asked her, I was like, do you ever like go by the mirror and be surprised? Like, you're like, Whoa, who's that old lady? And she's like, no, I know what I look like. I look in the mirror every day. I'm like, Oh, and I said, and how do you feel? She goes, I feel the same. I'm still the same person. Like, and you do have a little bit of that sameness all the way along. So don't, don't be afraid of getting old. Getting old is like really fun. So much fun. That's right. Indeed. And this interview has been fun on the bun. So you're welcome back anytime on this freaking show. Thank that's you. what I'm talking about. <laughs> indeed. That's right. Indeed. That's right. Indeed. Pod match wins again. So for those who I need know, to. I love pod match. 
<laughs> I love Podmatch. I think it's a great service. My goal is to book 52 appearances this year. So I'm, I'm partway there. There you go. I'm That's guessing this is service. number 25. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this is number 12, actually. Even dozen, I think, so far. Uh, out of the bookings. I think out of the, well, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look, but yeah. Yeah, this is like number, somewhere between 8 and 12, I think. So I can count. Uh, so I'm your preteen so and your eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, you know, I mean, I think Podmatch is great because you meet really cool people. And we're at, I don't know if Podmatch is paying you to say anything. They're not paying me to say anything, but I think it's a fantastic service. It's really cool. That's right. It's cooler than two cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's an English cucumber. It's very, very, very poetic. Super cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell we're going to have a five-hour interview. So, my goodness, before the five-hour interview appears, folks need to keep up with all the stuff that you're doing. So, for those who need to do just that, what's the best way for folks to do so? So, the best thing to do is go to my uh, go to my website. So, my website is lzrkconsulting.com, or for the Americans in the room, lzrkconsulting.com, and sign up for the newsletter. And I have a community, and I publish like once a month, and I write blogs and stuff. You can find me there. And you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram as well, Catherine Lazaric. And if you want to buy my books, go to my website, catherinelazaric.com. I'm really easy to find online. So it just depends on which avenue you want to take. Stay in touch, lzrkconsulting.com for my business world and catherinelazaric.com for my books. If you want to find me there and on your favorite retail platforms. If you like audiobooks, I narrate them. So enjoy. Right, right indeed. Like oh, right. I love it when authors yeah. read their own books, especially when they got great voices like yourself. I'm like, yes, thank you. Finally. Yeah, <laughs> Stephen Finally. King. You don't want to hear him read his own books. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get on drunk, it might be more interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> a plum pleasing pleasure dates so that's right folks follow the special k on all of our wonderful wares and their social medias on our website slide into our dms and be like hey you're freaking amazing that's right indeed love your old style you do great things that's right indeed i now see time as a giant wonderful apple pie and folks can just stop trying to take all the slices like i need some pie for me that's right indeed <laughs> Uh, and thanks for spending a slice with me today on the podcast. <laughs> there you go. That's right. It's a big old slice, a good old slice indeed. One that folks may need to devour five times over indeed. So before folks devour this interview again, any parting words before we close up shop? Any parting words before we close up shop? Hmm. Just go do the thing. Whatever you think you want to do, just go do the thing. Even just take a small step towards it. Doesn't have to be a big step, tiny step. Just go do the thing because the world needs you to be who you are. If you're hearing this part of the episode, that means you're one cool individual. Thanks a bunch for tuning in. And if you enjoyed what you heard, be sure to share it with at least one other person in your network. Bonus points for three. And be sure to check out the backlog too while you're at it because there are hundreds of wonderful episodes to choose from as well. 